Welcome to the Picky Nerds, and it's time for a video about archetypes. How about the full commander archetype breakdown? I'm your host, Joe Cherries. I'm your host, PZ, and that makes us the Nitpicking Nerds. We're bringing you daily magic content, which means a new video every single day for over 450 days. If wow. you want to support the channel directly and just inject your money right into the channel's veins, you can do it on Patreon. we got a link in the description, and there's fine people scrolling right now. Yeah, and the patron of the day is Thomas K. Thank you for your direct support, Thomas. We appreciate you, and we know you appreciate us, so... It's mutual appreciation here. How about indirect support? Well, they can do that through tcgplayer.com. We have an affiliate link in the description. You go to the description, click our link, and now you're on TCG Player. Buy the cards you were going to buy anyway, because who are you kidding? You Come were going to buy magic cards. Now you support the nerds, and you don't spend any extra money. And you can do the exact same thing on Dragon Shield, but there's an EU or a US link. So whatever's better for you lets you order product and sleeves straight from the source. Actually, the best sleeves in the multiverse. Good sleeves. And then that supports the channel as well. Yes. Uh, also, this channel, fully sponsored by Moxfield. We absolutely love Moxfield. Best deck building web website. And will they see the ad coming? Easy. Never. They, Don't even think about it. They, You're not going to see it coming. Yeah, they could never. slap you in the face. And also, happy birthday to everyone whose birthday is today. All right, let's get into this. We're talking about archetypes today. And we're talking about the biggest, the baddest, the most well-known, and the most played in all of Commander. All of those archetypes... And we're going to explain them, we're going to go over them, we're going to tell you what's their goal, what do they do, what is this deck actual thing, what's its strengths, what's its weaknesses. Just real quick on like 20 different ones, this should encapsulate about 90% of decks you will see at least. Uh, obviously there are, we can't cover every single archetype, we can't cover your uh, clones deck. Sorry. Ch Chandra Tribal. Very niche. Yeah. It's very niche. Clones is an archetype, but it's a niche archetype. Right. These top 20 are like most of what you're going to see. It's obviously not possible to encapsulate every single commander archetype. So this is really the best that we can do. And it's now on the internet for you. All right. Let's do this. Now, actually, I added something I'm going to ask you about each archetype that I think is a nice little thing. First, we have Aristocrats, one of the most popular archetypes of all time. The goal is to attain value from sacrificing smaller, expendable creatures while triggering dies abilities so pretty simple here we're gonna put lots of stupid creatures on the board we're gonna sacrifice them profit it's just it's a little it's that little tiny chart right so the checklist every aristocrat deck needs these first one sack outlets we're thinking viscera seer altar of dementia anything that says sacrifice a creature colon and then you can pick the best ones for your deck dies triggers otherwise what are you sacrificing creatures for so you need like blood artist or like bastion of remembrance and then cheap creatures to just throw on the battlefield and die R.I.P. I'm sorry, like Bloodgast and Nether Trader come to mind. Yeah, there's infinite uh, There's infinite things that fit in all these categories. Um, I think most important thing for Sack Outlet is why you want the Sacrifice Creature colon. If it costs mana, you can do it a lot less. So you want something that costs you no mana to do. It's not a tap ability. It is just Sacrifice a Creature colon because these decks want to sacrifice their whole boards all the time. The strengths of these decks is able to just drain out players over the game through incremental value while just playing. Also, board wipes don't really hurt these decks too bad, seeing as they get wiped off the board and they get all their dice triggers still. So th these things need to be answered individually, like you need to keep Blood Artists off the battlefield. Yeah, I would also add uh, there's a lot of combo potential because all the cards you're mm -hmm. playing anyway, five of them probably go infinite, like, you know, Pitiless Plunder and Revel Arc. Pretty hard not to go infinite with those cards, and they're in a lot of decks. Yeah, agreed with that completely. Uh, and the weakness of this deck, Grave Hate. Uh, Rest in Peace really shuts these decks down. They, you don't get your dice triggers, you don't get anything. Also, um, they are reliant on moving pieces. The dice triggers and the sack outlets, if you can keep if you can keep the dice triggers off the battlefield, the deck does nothing. If you keep the sack outlets off the battlefield, the deck is way weaker because it can't do things at will. So kill like Grim Horus Bexes and Midnight Reapers first. Yes. My question for you, BZ. Give me your stereotypical Aristocrats commander when you think of it. Oh, man. The first thing I thought of was, for some reason... Uh, Tesa Karlov, where you sacrifice a bunch of those tokens. 100% on the same page with you. That was the first thing I thought of, too. So, stereotypical commander for this, Tesa Karlov. Oh, we're just going to pick, like, the... I, I figured... Whatever we think of first. Exactly. I thought, why not just throw it up there? It's like, hey, who do you think... Like, if you see this commander, it's probably this deck. Hmm. All right. Let's go to the next one. It's a landfall. Landfall is pretty simple. You want to put as many lands in the battlefield and trigger landfall over and over and over again to cast large spells or to trigger your landfall abilities. I mean... Obviously, we have landfall abilities in our landfall deck. So what does a landfall deck need? It's not a super long list. You need extra ramps, so probably more than a typical deck is playing. So, you know, bust out your rampant growths and far seeks. Landfall triggers, rampaging bayloths, 
Call Me Hard Expedition, maybe? Your favorite uh, one, Tireless Tracker? Tireless Tracker, a much better example than a card I never <laughs> play. And then also, <laughs> big spells, mana sinks. For some reason, I'm thinking like Comet Storm. Walking Ballista. That yeah. Kind of, yeah, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the strengths of these decks are you gain advantage for simply playing lands, which is something you're going to do in the game anyway. So for ramping up, you're gaining advantage for ramping up, which is something you that every deck wants to do anyway. They want to gain a lot of mana so they can get to the late game and execute their game plan. This deck combines the game plan right into the the ramp, which is supposed to be just something every deck does. Yeah, lands are protected in Commander with the social contract, so you can't really set this deck back to the Stone Age. So, you can kill their stuff, but they still have like 15 lands in play. And this might not sound like a weakness, but I've actually seen this be a weakness of landfall decks. You do, you do eventually run out of lands, meaning as the gr game grinds into a really late game stall, if you don't have basics and you used all your basics early or you used all of your stuff you can ramp into early, suddenly you're left in this weird spot where late game, you're kind of out of gas. It has happened. Even in decks that are, I would say, the mana base is perfect. Uh, you really want to make sure you have like ramming up excavator stuff to avoid yep. this where you can at least loop fetch lands without finding anything. Yeah, I agree with you completely. So like, it, the, I think that landfall decks are some of the, they don't have that many weaknesses, but they're a little, I guess another weakness is, I guess, a little slower because they need to get off the ground. Their first two, three turns are always ramping, right? That's true. Give me your stereotypical commander. First one you think of. Phylath. Phylath for you? See, me for me, the first one that came to my head was the four color Omnath that has the triple landfall building. Him too. Next, we got Life Gain. The goal of these decks, surprisingly, uh, increase your life total and utilize it to meet benchmarks, pay it for advantage, and increase your staying power in a game. All right, the checklist for this is Life Gain. Obviously, you need cards that gain you life. Soul Sisters are some of the best ways to gain life. There's a bunch of those. Benevolent Offering is another one. That actually gains a lot of life. It's one of the best ways to gain a burst of life in the whole Commander format. You need ways to pay life, uh, like... Ether Flux Reservoir, Greed, Bolasa Citadel, Bolasa Citadel, ways to actually, when your life is up at 70, you don't need it to stay at 70, right? And yeah. so we can use that life total as a way to gain more advantage. We need cards that trigger off a life gain or care about our life gain. I mean, there's a lot of these. Well of Lost Dreams is the first thing that comes to my mind where you pay the life into it and you draw a bunch of cards. A Johnny wants you to be at 55. Yep. Yeah, it's another way to take advantage of it. Uh, the Strengths. Large life totals are amazingly strong to take down in any combat meta. Amazingly hard? The, yes. It's amazingly hard to take down like a person at 70 life. It's, it's a straight-up advantage in any combat-based meta that's not going to have combos. Oh, and then there comes right into the weaknesses. Uh, it's super weak to combos. It doesn't matter if your life total is at 100,000 if they go infinite and you just lose. Or if somebody directly wins the game, also doesn't matter what your life total is. Exactly. Also, uh, there's, there is a very niche weakness, but there's cards like Erebos, God of the Dead, that just say you can't gain life, and it completely shuts off your strategy. It's like unstoppable. It literally just, it, it shuts off your strategy, and like, Erebos specifically is indestructible, annoying, and hard to remove. Like, it is a card that when I played Life Game, I was like, I... Why? It's I, the rest in peace of life game decks. It really, really is. All right, give me your stereotypical life game, Commander. You go first. I was going to do uh, Karlov. That's the one that comes to my mind. But whenever you gain life, it gets counters, remove the counters to get rid of stuff. First one I thought of was Asterian the Decadent. I, I don't even know who that is. It's from D&D, the set that just came out. Okay. <laughs> All right, this next one we broke into two little categories. They're artifact decks, but there's two styles. The first one is onboard artifact. You're going to assemble a critical mass of artifacts on the battlefield to either do a bunch of combat damage or to maybe, like, sacrifice them, use them, weaponize them in some way, but you're going to be onboard critical mass. So you want some static artifact payoffs, things that are going to stay in play, while you sling your dinky artifact spells over and over. Things like Joyra are going to draw you cards. You want giant spells so that all this artifact mana can necessarily go to something. Mer Battle Sphere, Spine of Ishsa, some of the larger things you could do. And then you want ways to spam artifacts. I'm thinking like Foundry Inspector, Cost Reduction, or bringing artifacts maybe back from the graveyard to your hand. But Yeah, absolutely. Also, uh, the strengths of this deck are that uh, artifacts kind of do everything, a little bit of everything. So the whole deck can synergize while being all one type. So, like, you get a, all your ramp is also going to be artifacts, which are going to have more synergy with your deck. So I think artifact decks tend to have a lot more synergy than some other decks. Like, you might end up in uh, another deck and you put some artifact ramp in. That doesn't synergize with your deck. That's just sort of ramp you. This is the opposite, and you get a lot of extra uh, extra synergy. How many decks get to play 60 of the thing they care about? It's None of them? Not a lot. You can it's, play like seven artifact lands now. Yeah, exactly. It's a lot. Uh, the weakness, 
Artifact, hate. There's a lot of it. There's the Stony Silence type effects, which, you know, are a little, like, rule zeroed out of the format because they're... Vandal little, Blast? Uh, Vandal Blast. I, I mean, and you're going to be playing Artifact Land, so these are going to be extra, like... These are, like, board wipes for you. Like, whereas it's, like, kind of devastating to other players, takes away some of the ramps, some of the utility stuff. This is going to be so devastating to you, you're going to have, like, nothing afterwards. It's going to feel... Really rough. Like, you can be set really far behind with an artifact deck. Yeah, Dismantling Wave 2, Bane oh. of Progress. There's just a lot of things out there that will wipe you out. Wave of Vitriol. Oh, no. <laughs> that one doesn't even get around Indestructible. I, yeah, I well, know. Well, it does get around Indestructible. That one does get around Indestructible. Who's the stereotypical guy you're thinking of? I thought of Brea. Oh, man. Urza came to my mind oh. right away where it's just, it's all onboard artifacts. He just wants to put a million artifacts in play. I mean, that card's a little silly, isn't it? Now for the other side of Artifact decks, and that's the Artifact Reanimation decks. The goal of these decks is to sacrifice, discard powerful artifacts, get them into the graveyard, then cheat them out through some sort of reanimation style. So for your checklist, you're going to have to start by discarding or sacrificing these things. So we want to play like Faithless Looting, Doretti is going to be good for discarding, uh, Recursion, Doretti is going to be good for Recursion, <laughs> you can also use Trash for Treasure, and then you need the big boys. We're thinking like... Darksteel Forge is a pretty big one. Phyrexian Triniform. You can even go smaller, like Worm Coil or Mere Battlesphere. Yeah, all these cards, you just want to be cheating some mana uh, on your recursion. So if you play a three mana recursion spell and you get a six mana spell, you're saving three mana on that every single time. Strengths to these decks are they're able to cheat out huge, powerful artifacts early and can often just gain a ton of advantage. I mean, if you put Worm Coil on turn three, it's going to, like, make a huge difference in that game, be a huge threat for the whole game. Weaknesses, if you play Faithless Looting and discard Worm Coil Engine and then they play Scavenging Ooze and eat it, you're basically not going to play the game until that Scavenging Ooze is gone. Yeah, uh, like Graveyard Hate can absolutely hit out these decks also. Uh, less so than before, but you know, your again, your Stony Silences and your Artifact Hate, the board wipe's still gonna get you, still gonna get you dead sometimes. But like less so than uh, the onboard decks, but still Graveyard Hate can get you pretty bad. All right, give me your stereotypical artifact reanimation. You know, I probably got to go with Doretti. I mean, that was mine, too. That's the When I think of, like, this reanimation style artifacts, Doretti, the other one is Ozgear, too, obviously. Yeah, I subliminally messaged you with Doretti. I mentioned it twice. Yeah, I mean, I knew. You, you actually, with Kutch, you mentioned it about seven times. True. Next is equipment decks. We're looking to suit up creatures with equipment and crash in for massive combat damage bolstered by static bonuses. Checklist, we really need, like, lots of equipment. So, like, sort of X and Y. You could even fit in, like, sort of the Animist. Blackblade Reforged, you'll probably see a lot. Uh, removal protection. If your creature is not protected, it's just going to die. So, you probably, you know, the Teferi's protections are extra good here. Yeah, uh, even some spot. Maybe even some that just protect one creature. Because, Maybe like a deflecting swat. Yeah, uh, those kind of things too. Uh, creatures that can carry equipments well. You want things that might have protection, might have evasion, all all these sort of things so that when you put the equipment on it, it's suited up and ready to just be a huge threat. Yeah, you want creatures that hit hard though. Something like Aurelia or things that get extra bonuses for everything that's equipped to it. Yeah, that's completely fair too. Strengths, the abilities to make, this can make many different creatures threats with a ton of different equipments. No matter what you put them on, that thing's going to be a threat with enough equipment, right? It doesn't matter if it's a 1-1 one, one soldier. If you put three swords of X and Y and um, I don't know, let's a batter skull on There needs on to it. be more? <laughs> and a batter, yes, there needs to be one more. And a batter skull on it it's a huge threat. It doesn't matter what it was. Yeah, especially reducing equip costs is going to make it so that everything you play is equal of is of equal threat to your opponents, yep. and they're going to have to kill your equipments, not your creatures. And any creature sticks around, they're just going to kill them. Weaknesses, obviously, uh, all your equipments are artifacts. So if they die to board wipes, <laughs> that's second, bad for you. This is the third deck in a row that is weak to artifacts. Yeah, watch out for Vandal Blast, I guess. Yeah, the, these last three decks all do not like uh, <laughs> Vandal Blast. At all. Well, sometimes you can actually just have a hard time keeping a creature on the field. Yes. You can have seven equipment out, and then, all right, here's my guy, Pure Steel Paladin. Suit him up, and then someone plays, like, Fleshbag Runner. Like, okay, here's my commander. Suit him up. And then someone's, like, board wipe. So, uh, yeah, what a, what a deck like this does is it makes equipment its own type uh, that you have to play a bunch of in the deck, which takes away from your creature count, your ramp count. Every It just takes away from all your other counts because you have to draw from somewhere, right? You have to. And ultimately, what usually ends up happening is your creature count ends up a little lower than you want it to be, even though you would love it to be 30, it's tough to have 30 creatures and 15 equipment. That's a lot. That's 45 cards in your deck. Yeah, for this one, I think of Akiri Fearless Voyager. I 
I can say I'm I'm thinking of Sir Gwyn. That's the one Sir that comes. Gwyn. Yeah, Sir Gwyn just cheats all the equipment costs. I think she's so cool. Next is similar but distinctly different. It's Voltron. We're trying to power up a single creature with equipment, auras, or counters and connect for lethal damage, usually with your commander. That's the most common way to do it. Yeah, this is always just going to be like everything in one spot, always. You just throw everything in one spot and you go in. Uh, the checklist here, you need a powerful commander. So if your commander's a 1-1, one, one, not the best Voltron commander. I would suggest maybe going to something that's got a little more bulk, maybe some evasion on it. Well, while, while we're here, since we need examples, let's just give our stereotypical example now. I would think of Rafik for this one. Uh, funnily enough, I I think I thought of uh, the stupid 7-7 seven, seven that attacks randomly because I think that one's silly. <laughs> oh, Ruhan. Ruhan. That was what I thought of. I mean, there's a ton. Uh, but also Ural is probably a much better example. Miss Stalker, yep. Uh, you need ways to enhance power. Rancor comes to mind because it's super cheap. It's going to be coming out again. And then, like, things that care about if you're on the aura side or the equipment side, how many of that thing is on there, like ethereal armor. Ethereal armor, I think of a uh, mask of, what is it? Ancestral mask? Ancestral mask. That one pumps up a ton. Yeah, you need ways to really get them, like, this is a one-shot kill. Good luck not dying. And then protection, you can easily have equipments and auras that give this hexproof or indestructible, and then now it's going to be really tough. The strengths of this deck, you're going to go taller than any other deck at the table. You're going to have the biggest creature pretty much at all times, and often you'll just be able to one-shot players out to the game that are the biggest threat to you. Yeah, you really want trample, so I would say definitely make sure you have trample or unblockable somehow, maybe flying. The weaknesses, though... You got maybe five or six creatures in this deck that you actually want to deal lethal damage with. Commander and then a few backups. If they get removed, it's a huge setback. It's a huge setback, too, because like if you're playing auras, you don't get to replay those. Those go to your graveyard. The equipment's all fall off. You lose all that mana advantage. All the counters just gone. You can lose. Sometimes like your Voltron commander dying can be like a 6-7 for one, and that's really rough. Yeah, or like you think the shields are down and you're ready, and you tap all the way out, and then someone like Force of Wills you, and you're just like, that I can't win. Yeah, it's 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 a tough deck to play because of how far you really can be set back by a single removal spell at times. It feels like we're slowly transitioning. Like every one of these archetypes has been like kind of similar to the one after. This is Enchantress. So now we're on the the auras and uh, enchantment side. We're casting a million enchantments, drawing a million cards along the way, and we're overwhelming opponents with just like sheer card quantity. We're just gonna keep throwing stuff at them because we have. The first thing on the checklist, Enchantress is whenever you cast an enchantment, draw a card. Our Gothian Enchantress. Seder Enchanter and everything in between. There's literally a billion of these, right? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's probably at least 15. Yeah, there's a ton. They literally say whenever you cast or whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield, one of those two, draw a card. It's really simple. You also need a ton of enchantments, obviously. Little you, baby dinky ones. Yeah, you want you want um, the co the less they cost, the better they are for your deck because you want to be cycling through all of your enchantments. You Mana want Bloom? Mana Bloom. You want, you, like, Mana Bloom. I'm thinking, like, Rest in Peace is great in this deck because... Kenra's Transformation. Yeah, Kenra's Transformation. Because, like, Rest in Peace is, like, you don't want to just throw that in any deck, but you can throw it in a deck like this, depending on if you have Graveyard Tages or not. Stonely Silence, extremely good in this deck because it actually cycles even if it's not shutting anything down. At least it drew a card. A lot of the finishers take the form of, I think, Replenish. They really... It's a big one. It, they really do. Uh, so don't play Recipes in that deck. Yeah, that is true. Uh, the I mean, the strengths of this deck is the card draw. You're going to be able to find what you're looking for, and there's so many threats, and Enchantment is one of the hardest permanent types to answer. I would say the hardest. You, other than land, yeah. Other, other than, than lands, because you have to break the social contract. Yeah, exactly. So, like, it is extremely hard to answer enchantments, and they just stick on the battlefield. They usually go wide on enchantments, too, so you need to wipe enchantments, which is not a super common thing. They exist, but they're not everywhere. Yeah, the weaknesses, without Voltroning something, you really have a tough time putting the game away. Joe had an Enchantress deck, and he, you know, he could have Nyx Bloom Ancient and seven Enchantresses out, and he's like, boy, I hope I draw my like Helix Pinnacle and can pay 100 mana and wait my whole turn. Exactly, yeah. It's really, really... Uh, I really think that without a Voltron strategy, which is a different strategy, I mean, you can do a Trancher slash Voltron. That yeah, is a, sure. That is a thing. You're just going to struggle. Replenish effects are going to be the biggest win count, like we said, and you have to build that up over time, over a really long game, so it's going to be tough to get to that point. Who's your stereotypical Enchantress commander? Stupid Sithis. Yeah, me too. I mean, Sithis is literally an Enchantress. And in, an enchantment. And an enchantment in the command zone. It couldn't be more perfect. Next is tokens. We're still flooding the board, but obviously small, tiny creatures. Best way to do that is tokens, so we're going to use tokens. We're going to swarm our opponents. They're never going to be able to block all our things because we're talking 20, 30 creatures on the field. 
All right, so what we need for these decks, we need token makers, obviously. Iron Man and Cans are the way to go most of the time. We have Secure the Waste. We also have Avengers Endicar. These cards just make such large amounts of tokens by themselves. They're just single card threats. And you want to pump the tokens, and Avengers Endicar does both of those things. Also, Felidar Treat does both of those things. Um, it's yep. just going to make cats, and then pump your team with Landfall. Crater of Behemoth is what I think of immediately. That's the my, big one. That's the pump. That is the go-to pump effect. Also, uh... Kathar's Crusade, another yeah, like, big one. There is no question that a tokens deck has no problem ending the game ever. Like they only pretty much, pretty much need five or six things, and they can take you out. Uh, so the strength is uh, going wide. Yeah, it's pretty simple. You literally go wider than any other deck at the table, right? So nobody's going to be able to stop you because you're going to overrun them with so many tokens. Then after you get so many tokens, you pump them up, and the attacks are going to be lethal at whoever is the biggest threat or everybody, perhaps. You don't even have to do that much. Just like make ten tokens and then give them plus three plus three. That's lethal on somebody. The weakness of this deck, board wipes. And oh boy, it's a little tougher to protect these things without having exactly Teferi's protection. And there's like one other maybe card that protects. But tokens tend to get wiped off the board very, very easily. You really need to make sure they stay on the board. And it's tough to do. You have Teferi's protection, and then you run out of options quick. That's why the instant speed ways to make them are great, because you dodge board wipes. They can't do anything. Uh, I would say the biggest silver bullet card for me on this one is probably Elishnorn. You just, oh, yeah. all your tokens die, and now you can't make tokens until Elishnorn's gone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anything that's keeping your tokens off the battlefield, once they're gone, it's really, really tough to do anything. Uh, stereotypical commanders, I'm thinking Jetmir now, because Jetmir is my new token commander. See, what I think of is Tristani Celestia's voice. That's a little off the beaten path, but it's really cool. Yeah, that one's big tokens. That's, a, that's not the stereotypical token deck that we're talking about here. Up next, we have Treasure. Treasure has become an extremely popular archetype as of late. Obviously, we're going to make treasures and weaponize the treasures. These are artifacts. They're, we can take advantage of them entering the battlefield. We can take advantage of them making mana. We can do whatever we want with these things. They're really powerful artifacts. Yeah, they also get sacrificed. There's a lot of things that care about that. Yep. Checklist, uh, number one, I'd probably say make treasures. You probably want, at this point, 20 to 30 cards that like can make treasures or repeatedly make treasures. Brass's Bounty is some of the one-shot ones that are really big. Goldspan Dragon makes it over time. And Goldspan Dragon also falls into the treasure payoffs. Like, Zorn, make an extra one. Make the treasures have more mana. Uh, Jolene is a good treasure payoff. I really like Reckless Fireweaver as a way to Ooh. weaponize them. Uh, I think that's a great way to do it. Marionette so, Master. Marionette Master, another great way to weaponize your treasures. Strength, this deck has access to a lot of mana. You're going to be able to play out almost everything you want to play out and not struggle on mana, even if you don't draw your ramp side, because your normal cards that are like what your deck's designed to do are ramp themselves. Yeah, if you resolve something like fa uh, Professional Face Breaker, you can basically just storm off all your treasures, cast more cards that make treasures, that draw you into more cards that make treasures. It's just like an endless loop. The weakness, again, uh, we, Artifact Hate is a big one for these decks. I mean, if your treasures don't do anything, even them entering tapped can be huge. I've seen Blind Obedience. Yeah, Blind is bad. Blind Obedience really shuts down treasure decks to a point where it's like, oh, I'm a, literally a whole turn slower. Everybody gets to react to what I was going to do on my last turn. Who's your stereotypical commander? Uh, Jolene, first thing I thought of, so Pro let's go with her. Prosper's the one I think of, yeah. where he just, he just makes so many treasures. I know he's a Play From Exile deck, but he's also a treasure commander. Next, we got tribal decks. This can be like a wide range of anything, so it casts a pretty wide net. We're assembling a group of creatures that share a type and using the tribal payoffs for that type, or in general, to enhance them. Yeah, this one's interesting. Um, all tribes are not created equally, but we cannot go over everyone individually. Nor will we. Nor, yeah, exactly. It's like zombies is vastly different strategy from goblins, but we're meshing them together here. Like BZ said, you need a critical mass of the tribe. If you're goblins, you want 30 plus goblins in your deck. Zombies, 30 plus in your deck. I would say don't show up with less than 20. Yeah, it, definitely not. And you need unifying payoffs. You need things that pump them, that care about them. Like whenever a zombie dies, do something. Kindred whenever, Discovery is probably the best one. Yeah, cheat goblins in the play. Uh, goblin Recruiter, stack your deck full of goblins. Things like that that are going to make your tribe just function because they all work together. Elvish Arctur is the first one I think of for that one. Uh, so let's see the strengths. A lot of synergy in the creature base part. It different differs between whatever the tribe is, but the plan is when I have six creatures in play, it's much better than when anyone else has six creatures in play. Yes, so like literally, the deck synergy is like every. If you have five creatures in play, they're all working together to do whatever your game plan is. Like goblins, they're overwhelming you and overrunning you. Elves, they're making a million mana to cast more to make, cast more elves 
and go off. Zombies, they're sacrificing going to the graveyard and coming back, and you're doing all sorts of things like that. No matter what your tribe is, you play to its strength, like the tribe's specific strength, and just any number of like small amount of creatures is easy to like pay off. The worst thing for these decks, mostly board wipes. Uh, this isn't every deck because zombies are not as hurt by board wipes as, say, a goblin deck. But if you keep the creatures off the battlefield, obviously, this is a tribe. Tribe means that it's all creature cards, so they're obviously going to struggle if they're wiped off the board. Yeah, there's no anti-tribe cards. It's not like creatures that have the same tribe get minus one, minus one. There's no playable card like that. Yeah, exactly. Who's your stereotypical tribal commander? I'm thinking I'm thinking Cranko off the top of my head. I'm thinking Will Howell. See, I was going to pick an elf commander because I love elves, but Morophon. I just think Morophon is the unifying nonsense card that is whatever you want. Yeah, it definitely is. Next, plus one, plus one counters. Very specific strategy, but very popular. What are what they do? Uh, well, you generate extra plus one counters plus one counters through static effects, cards that put them on the creatures, and you, use, and you make a giant board state that's utilizing counters either by combat with huge creatures or some other cards that pay off counters in other ways. Checklist. You obviously need counters cards. And by this, we mean like cards that put counters on creatures, cards that enter with counters. And I think you, you obviously want to also have cards that pay off counters. So it's like your walking ballista, yeah, it enters with counters, but also when you put extra counters on it, it's paying off those counters. Yes, you need enhancements. So we're talking like hardened scales. Uh, doublers also fall into this. So like doubling season, hardened scales, branching evolution to where when I put one counter on, I'm putting a bunch. Or even like good fortune unicorn where they all enter with a counter. Yeah, you you need you need to enhance the number of counters everything's going to have. You need extra counters. Hardened scales is a perfect example where you just every time you put one counter, no, we put two counters and it's amazing. The last thing I think every deck needs is also a way to like turn counters into something. So like Walking Ballista and Triskelion are huge. Crystalline Crawler is another I, one. I agree with you completely on that. I, I, like I was saying earlier, like uh, Crystalline Crawler is perfect. Like too. spending counters. Yeah, you need to spend counters. There's, there's uh, also ones that give you card advantage, like Mindless Automaton. Yeah, even that yeah. one. Yeah, like it turns them into cards. Like I like having, you want to turn your counters into other things. Uh, the strength of these decks, uh, you're able to build up counters Make a huge board state. Often you go very, you can go very tall because it can be a combat-based deck, or you can weaponize counters in other ways. So it's a little, it's versatile in that it doesn't need to necessarily go through combat. It can go so big and like, oh, well, I have a 10-10 creature, my Savala will tap for 10 mana and go other direction. Yeah, like I'm gonna play Strength of the Tajuru, which is the first one I thought of with Vor and Klex and Branching Evolution and deal a thousand damage to you with Triskelion. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's just ridiculously over the top strong weakness. weakness. You're on board. You're all on board. Everything is on the board, meaning when you get wiped off the board, you're set back to the Stone Age. You literally have to start over and rebuild from scratch. Unless That's you why have, you got to have ways to spend counters. Or why cards like the Ozolith are really, really strong. There's also the new white card that's kind of like the Ozolith. Yeah, where they move around to something else, like a land. Who's your stereotypical commander? Mine, personally. I mean, it's Helana Elena at this point. I mean, I play that deck so much and it's become such a counters deck. Got to go with my boy, Skullbriar. Skullbriar, also a pretty sweet counters deck. The next archetype you're going to really want to be prepared for, because you see this one a lot, Moxfield.com. Everyone's going to be showing up to these tables having already built a deck on Moxville.com. And one of the strengths of it is that you get organization, tools, sorting methods to where you can build your deck more efficiently, see the curve, lay everything out. And so the weaknesses, there aren't any. So if you're showing up, not brewing a Moxville deck, and you're against three Moxville decks, you're going to lose. What I love about Moxfield is they absolutely listen to everybody. Um, if you have a complaint, if something's not working on Moxfield, they have a Discord. Go talk to Harry, and he will get whatever is not working fixed. If he can, if he can repeat the problem and see how it's done, he'll have a fix in a day. Harry is the best. Go use it. Go use it. I was gonna say peace out, Trap Scott, but this is the end of the video. We have another one. Let's go on to the next one. Next is Super Friends. Very, very popular. Kind of hated on, and I'm not 100% sure why, but the goal is to get multiple Planeswalkers onto the battlefield and activate their ultimate abilities way ahead of schedule. Yeah, so the checklist you need, you obviously need lots of Planeswalkers. We're a Planeswalker deck, but you can't just have any Planeswalkers. You can't have good value ones here and there, but you also need ones that are able to ultimate easily with things like doubling season. Always on your mind. Yes, we need increase the things that increase loyalty. Uh, so I'm thinking Pierre, I'm thinking Lazelle, I'm thinking Vornclex, Vornclex, and I'm thinking Proliferate. Uh, doubling season, I'm thinking Proliferate. All of these things are super important to this deck because if you're just playing your Planeswalker and trying to get to the ult in the normal way, it's not going to happen. It's, it's 
Well, it'll happen. One every hundred games, and you're not going to be very happy with how your deck's performing. If I had to pick some of the best Planeswalkers for this deck, maybe Bant Tamio, whose Omniscience is the ultimate. Even the other the other Tamio's really, really strong, yeah, too. Yeah, and I would maybe do Teferi Master of Time, because that thing's going to ultimate in like one second with a peer out. Yeah, that thing's also very, very strong. The strengths of this deck, Planeswalkers do gain incremental advantage over time, so every single turn, if that you untap with a Planeswalker, you will get more and more advantage out of a single card, but it takes time to do, obviously. Um, also, it's easily paired two card. And, I mean, doubling season certain planeswalkers is almost certainly a victory. Deep glow skate, deep glow skate. Also, another way to do that. Weakness, you have to rely on the weakest type of commander. It's planeswalkers. They can be attacked. They can be destroyed. No other type of commander can be attacked uh, to be destroyed. Like if you're behind on board, you just can't play your spells. Yeah, and it's really, it's really, really rough. I mean, planeswalker decks, they are playing from behind a lot. Um, Something that actually we didn't mention for card you, checklist you need, you actually need board wipes. Uh, a lot of them. You need board wipes because you want to be able to go, you want to build up your board, play some planeswalkers, then, you know, the board, will, they'll build up. It's like, well, now I can't play as many planeswalkers. Board wipes, start playing more planeswalkers. Your planeswalkers don't die to your board wipes, so it's always nice. We can at least take advantage of it, but yeah. they can be attacked. I mean, Atrax is my super friends commander when I think of Ooh, it. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, the first one I thought of weirdly was Karth the Lion, <laughs> green, yeah. black. It is green, black planeswalkers. I mean, yeah. that's true. I mean, you're not wrong. Next is a deck I have tried so many times and I can just never get it to stick. Storm and Spellslinger. The goal, chain together a large number of instants and sorceries to trigger payoffs and eliminate opponents. Sometimes little chip damage, sometimes all at once. Yeah, so uh, obviously you need payoffs for casting spells. Whenever you cast a spell, do X. Gutter uh, Snipe. Uh, Gutter Snipe, Archmage and Miridus, all of these ones. Uh, Aetherflux Reservoir. Anything that says, I cast a spell, I get blank. That's You need those for sure. You also need tons of cheap cantrips and you almost always want ritual type effects so that you can get more mana to cast more cheap cantrips to get your storm cut out because if you're just relying on only the mana you've played from a single land each turn, you can only cast six spells if you have six lands. I mean, obviously that's not exactly true, but it's about true. You want like rituals like, you know, Jessica's Will, Mana Geyser are really good, but you also want to like pseudo rituals like Goblin Electromancer that just reduce the cost yeah, of things. Yeah, exactly. The Strengths of the deck, they have extremely explosive turns, often winning out of nowhere. Sometimes a Spellslinger deck can have nothing on board and they untap and they just chain together spells in a way that just results in a victory. And that's, I mean, like, that is something that a lot of decks can't do. Make a bunch of mana, this, even the new Storm King's Thunder, and then you can die to like a Lightning Bolt. Yeah, exactly. It, it's... Something I like that this is this is something unique to this deck style. You really winning out of nowhere is possible for other decks, but this one does it better than any other deck. If we're talking non infinite, very few decks can even do that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the weakness it requires setup usually. Uh, obviously, there are the explosive trains I just talked about, but you want to get your creatures on board, and your creatures aren't going to be reduced, so you need to like play out your creatures or your payoffs. Uh, I mean, I'm not like gutter snipe. We need to play out, and we can usually follow up with a spell or two, but we have to wait till next turn to really have that explosive turn, and that's usually the weakness of this deck. Uh, also, early game, you don't do anything. I, I mean, think I think this deck can, like, unlike most other decks, can, like, just backfire on itself, because we always talk about the ratio of, like, non-spells in your spell deck to spells, and sometimes you just draw the wrong half of your deck. Yeah, that is very, very true. I Like I said, early, I think I think you're one of the weakest decks early game. You just, you don't have anything. You're not an on-board deck. You, you're getting hit for all of the chip damage early. The first spell singer commander I think of is Veyran. It's nothing like over the top or anything, but you know, it does pay off. It doubles all your triggers off of uh, your Magecraft. I don't know if this counts, but Niv Mizzet Perun comes to mind. Uh probably just dead to that card if they untap, but if they don't, then they're spell slinging. Yeah, actually, he fits in another one coming up. Uh next, group hug. The goal is to give out resources to every player. Uh you're looking to like add more resources to the game to make it faster. Also, if you are looking if your group hug deck is the one that's kind of the, that's intended to win, your goal is going to be to use politics on your side by giving certain players certain resources. You basically weaponize one player against two sometimes or two people against one and then you break it down so that you're the final you're in the final two and then you kind of just play standard, you know, and you just beat them with your creatures and normal stuff. Yeah, so the checklist of cards you need, you just need cards that give out resources, right? Rights of Flourishing is the first thing that comes to my mind. I really don't like that card. I think it is one of the most game-ruining cards in all of Commander, but that's just my personal Well, opinion. we don't like this archetype. Yeah, that is very true. I think it just changes the whole dynamic of things. But if you tell me ahead of time, it should be fine. I just don't like going, oh, okay, that's the game we're playing. But yeah, you need to give out a bunch of resources, which is normally bad for you. So make sure there's a way to make it good for you. Yeah, the strength of this deck is that you're going to be able... You have tons of things to give out, so you're going to be able to politically uh, work with your friends and get, you know, people on your side. 
That's the only strength, though. I mean, <laughs> yeah. these decks don't have a lot of strength. The weakness... You're giving you're, out resources. I mean, is it's really obvious. You don't want to be giving other players resources. That's never the goal of Commander. So I don't know... Well, not never. It's almost never the goal of Commander. So if you, like, if you, if you start with my main goal... One of my, one of my main goals is to win. Yes, obviously I want to have fun, but one of my main goals is to win. Group hug falls out real quick. The Venn, the Venn diagram of wanting to win and giving your opponents resources... There is the tiniest little sliver of overlap. One of the cards I like, though, for Group Hug that I actually think is cool, and I wish there was more cards like this, is Forced Fruition. Where you're just giving away way too many resources, and they cannot possibly use them. I, I think that card's sweet. I also like uh, like the Offering Cycle, like where yeah. you give out stuff, but you get all of it. Right. So you get extra out of it. Um, For this first commander that comes to mind is Kineos and Tiro. Uh, he's, not, he's not always Group Hug, but he can definitely be Group Hug. Yeah, that's a good one. Mine's Kineos and Tiro, because I can't think of another I one. I guess they. Feldegriff. There you go. Feld. Yes, Feldegriff is a definitely Kingmaker one. extraordinaire. This next archetype is called Wheels, but I'm going to call it Wheelin' and Dealin' because that's way cooler. The goal is to repeatedly cast Wheel cards to cause players to discard and draw just massive amounts of cards. We're trying like Wheel Fortune, Windfall, Dark Deal, Time Spiral. Obviously, we need all those kind of cards. We need Wheels, as BZ said, and we need to pay them off like by either punishing our opponents for drawing or punishing our opponents for discarding. Begrim for the discard side is like the first thing. Liliana's Caress. Phyrexian Tyranny for drawing. For Phyrexian Tyranny for drawing and like, wow, well, might as well just do the commander right now because I'm thinking about it. Nekuzar is the first commander that comes to my mind. Nekuzar the Mind Razor? Uh, yeah. Is that the 2-4 for Tuna Grixis? It is. And okay. also, Zyrus is the other one that Ooh. comes to my mind. Well, you're trying to steal all mine. Uh, the strengths is as soon as you untap when you're set up, wheeling, chaining wheels actually isn't that bad for you because you're demolishing your opponents and you're going to get access to all the cards. Let's say, you yes. wheel, let's say you wheel three times. You get access to 28 cards, all four hands you saw when you wheel three times. They're only going to get the last seven they end up with. And it's on your turn, so you, you're always the first one to get access to any number of the cards that you're wheeling for. Obviously, if you want to play, like, Time Spiral is amazing in this deck because you Time Spiral, you wheel, you get all the effects you wanted, and then you reset your turn because you untap six lands. Weakness, you do give access to a ton of cards to your opponents. This is obviously, you have to negate this effect because your opponents are going to see just, they're going to see just as many cards as you unless you break the parity, which is something you will try and do. What you're going to see no matter what you do though is more instants from them because they're going to draw into some of their cheaper stuff, some of their freer stuff, and they're going to try to nature's claim because they have it and they're going to lose it. Yeah, exactly. So the, you're giving out a lot of resources. It's actually, wheels are kind of group hug-esque. They're not exactly group hug. This is distinctly different, I think. But oh, it, it, can... it is distinctly different. I agree with that. But I'm saying it's group uh, hug ask in that you're giving resources that you're going to be punishing them for, but they can still use those resources against you. Yeah, play a wheel without any of these payoffs and watch yourself lose in like two seconds. <laughs> Wheels are really bad without payoffs. Yeah. All right, PC, what if I just let you do this one because you absolutely love this archetype. This is my favorite archetype of all time. It's creature-based graveyard strategies. The goal is to fill your graveyard and gain card advantage from the spells put into it, possibly by reanimating creatures, but that is optional. Checklist, you want self-mill, so I'm thinking Stitcher Supplier, Altar of Dementia is absolutely ham sandwich in this deck. Reanimation, reanimate, animate dead, even creatures that do it like Frexian Delver. Card advantage through the graveyard, so like... Self-milling into a blood gas basically draws your card because now you can just access it from your graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, strengths, it's just so it's so resilient. If you don't graveyard hate this deck, which is obviously the weakness of it, then you will never out advantage it ever. Yeah, exactly. The this has a sense of inevitability that the, as the game goes on and on and on, if the graveyard isn't answered, that the deck that is playing out of its graveyard will obviously be the deck that has the most advantage and be able to win. Basically, have a greater hand size than you. I mean, forever. Yeah, and obviously, like we said, graveyard hate is shuts these decks down hard. Like it's a reset. So even though these decks have the one of the best uh, late games, they're very weak to graveyard hate. Like to the point that their strategy is like it. You can't function. Uh, with your deck with a rest in peace in the field. Like, your deck is bad. Yeah, you gotta kill that thing. Yeah, you have to get rid of it. Uh, Bajooka Bog sets you back. It's not the end of the world, but you really gotta make sure that if you see one coming for some reason, just have a backup, you know. Don't play all your self-mill out when you don't need to. My uh, my commander, Carador, is the first thing I think of, obviously. Uh, yeah, my commander, actually, the second Carador deck I built. Yeah. You're thinking of the first one. I'm thinking of the second one. I mean, BZ has put Carador as the quintessential Greyfair commander in my head until probably until the day I pass away, if I had to guess. Marin's the other one that's not as cool. Definitely not as cool. Strictly less cool. All right, next... Flicker decks. These are really cool. We're going to play creatures with strong enter the battlefield abilities. Then we're going to exile them and bring them back to the battlefield to get that enters the battlefield ability again. Obviously, we need creatures with 
awesome ETBs. That's very simple. I mean, name two. Name two with awesome ETBs. Right now. I mean, Agent of Treachery oh. is the first one that comes to my mind. Cloud Blazer is another one that comes to my mind, like right away. Agent of Treachery. Agent Ugh. of Treachery. If you don't, if you don't know how good Agent of Treachery is, put it in any deck without Blink, and you'll be like, oh, this character's doing this without Blink. If somebody flickers at once. I kind of just want to concede. I don't, but it feels like I might as well sometimes, even if I do end up uh, beating it. One of the so grossest miserable. things you can do is Agent of Treachery, kick right a replication on it. Disgusting. That's not even real. It's literally disgusting. Draw, what are you drawing, 18 cards? <laughs> yeah, on your end stuff, draw 18 cards. Take the cards. five best things. I think you also want to save one or two spots for Mass Blink. Like, Eerie Interlude specifically is, like, amazing. I don't think you can leave home without it. You should it. probably but, mention regular Blink, too. We want ways to flicker our creatures. Yeah. We need ways we need to make them exit the battlefield and re-enter the battlefield over and over again. And we can we could do that by bouncing it to our hand, which is a pseudo blink, but we just want to go exile, battlefield. Like simple. Ephemerate is a Ephemerate, cheap one. uh uh Charming Prince is the one that comes to my mind. Very cheap. Yorian's a good one. Uh yeah, so also you probably want to have mass mass blink because when you can save your creatures from a board wipe and or trigger all the ETBs again, you are going to bury people in cards. It's so much card advantage. These deck strengths are card advantage. I mean, every one of your creatures gets you an ETB that gets you some sort of effect that hopefully is a card's worth. And then if you start, once you start flickering them over and over again, all of a sudden, all of your little tiny threats that were like, oh, I don't have to kill Mold Drifter. It did its thing. It's like, nope, but Mold Drifter just drew 10 more cards because my deck is designed to be blinking every single turn. You like have to two for one yourself. Yeah, uh, one of the biggest weaknesses of the deck, I think they're extremely mana hungry. You want to be spending your mana every single turn, and you often not have enough mana to do everything you want to do because a lot of the best ETBs are on four, five, six mana creatures, which obviously makes sense, right? Your best ETBs are obviously on your bigger creatures, so that uh, if you play out a creature, you might not have a way to blink it right away. So they're a little, I think that, but once these decks, if they ramp up and you get going on a ramp, I, these decks are unstoppable. I think the best flicker color would probably be like Bant, because you just get access to green, and they yes. have all those ETB ramp cards, and it's just out of control. Yeah, exactly. When you add Wood Elves into your Blink deck, it Wood becomes... Elves for Temple Garden Ephemerate. Yeah, um, uh, Rune is the first one that comes to my mind. Our, one of our good friends, Rude, plays the deck, so... Think of Brago. You think of Brago? Yeah, but it's... Come on. Rude? I mean, it was on Shuffle Scuffle, so... It was on Shuffle Scuffle. All right, let's go on to the next one. This is probably the most fun one on the list, right? It's not even close. It's stacks. The whole point of the stacks is to slow the game down and restrict other players and yourself because they're usually effects that affect everyone from doing certain stuff in the games. Like you're going to put something like a winter orb down to make everyone not untap their lands to slow the game down to like a pace that you can control. Uh, you obviously need stacks effects. I'm thinking winter orb. I'm thinking rest in peace. Uh, Stony Silence. There's no a, Rod. No Rod. There's a million stacks effects. Blood Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, back to Basics. All of these are, uh, what are they called? Stacks effects. I don't. Yeah, I don't know what you're gonna say. Literally the name of the deck. Uh, and you need ways to break parity. So you need them. Yes, exactly. So something like Winter Orb in an Urza deck is some of the first, the, one of the first and easiest ways to break parity. Winter Orb won't let anyone else untap more than one or what two. I don't remember what it says exactly, but whatever. And then you tap it before your turn. And Winter Orb said if it's tapped, its effect doesn't work because it's an old artifact. So right, if you're Ooh. mono, if you're mono red and Blood Moon, you've just broken parity like super hard. Uh, the, what Derevi too? That's the one I think of as a commander. Derevi, we're just but static, for, static orb, Winter Orb. Everything's tapped except oh, all my creatures are just gonna tap, untap more things and let me do more than you. Yeah, exactly. It just break. You're breaking parity. Well, like, let's not forget Stasis. Stasis. Oh, one of the most fun ones, Stasis right? Stasis and Derevi is a hard lock, basically. Yeah, nobody wants to play against that. Uh, okay, so the strength is obviously the ability to slow all players down. You're using effects that are negative on everybody, and when you use things that are negative on everybody, generally it's a positive for you because everyone is slowed down, and then you break the parity, uh, and your deck is just wins. But the weakness is that this can impede your own game plan. You're obviously slowing down, and you get to choose when and where you play stacks piece, but sometimes you can't break parity, and what are you going to do? Not play your cards? And then you're not playing the game. So it's like either you don't play your cards or you slow down your own game plan. Sometimes the best thing is slow down your own game plan. That's definitely a weakness. And if you're if you're um, not able to restrict mana too much, you're just wide open for like a bane of progress. All your hard work is gone. Yeah, I agree completely. Oh, and then a uh, non-gameplay weakness of the deck, everyone hates it, and it basically breaks the social contract, which is we're here to spend time together and it's roughly decided that we're all going to spend an equal amount of time getting to play our decks and do things. Just rules. This is like a rule zero deck. Once you all agree about it, 
great. There's no problem. But if you don't, then there's a problem. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, commanders, Derever, you said, is there any other stacks commander you think of? I No, Gand, Arbiter, Augustin. That's the, the classic. Fourth. That is the stacks commander. And there's only one left. We finally did it. It's control. We're going to use excessive amounts of card draw and removal to answer threats and ensure our survival into the late game where our win conditions can just take over and dominate. Yeah, you need tons of board wipes for these stacks. You need to keep the board clear you're going to be slow out of the gate um so you need to make sure that once everyone develops the board you can get rid of it you need you need like you don't just need like the two or three that most decks have you need the five six i think seven. five to eight you know that's yeah you need a lot of them uh you need two for ones you need cards that don't just you know you do want your nature's claims you know if you're in a green control deck and but you're also going to want your wing graces judgments your coligans commands your coligans commands to make sure you're also getting two for one so that all your cards are getting you need each one of your cards to get more than one card's worth in a control deck because and you need lots of card draw because we're trying to control everybody so we up yeah, we obviously need more cards we need we need our cards to do more than everyone else's cards so we need them not to be one for ones like we can play one for ones but that's not going to be good enough for this deck and then we need the slam dunk finishers right what do you think of for the slam dunk finishers slam dunk finishers is tough because uh, i have a deck that i guess we would consider control it's queen marchesa which i would list as my control commander of choice some of the slam dunk finishers can just be things that will just kill them guaranteed like blind obedience is going to sit there and deal damage to them perforos is going to sit there and then if you survive two turns with it they're just going to lose. I you think can even just go for Torment of Hailfire. I like, was going to say, I hey, think, you let me live long enough, you're dead. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, your control deck, um, Torment of Hailfire and X spells are really good ways to put put away the game. Control wants to go to the late game, and if you execute your game plan and get there, X spells are going to be a great way to pay it off. The strengths of these decks are that you're, you have one of the best late games. Uh, you're, oh, yeah. Once, once your deck um, stays out and stabilizes, you're going to be the biggest threat from turn like eight on in the game but uh, obviously the weakness is you're slow out of the gate and you're going to be the person getting chipped in for all the damage you need to use politics to protect yourself and sometimes people aren't going to listen to your politics and when they don't it puts you in a position where it's like wow all the other players are actually aware that i'm a huge threat even I've, though i have nothing on board i've never had that happen i have only joe realizes uh, i have been realizing forever that that deck needs to die and people don't listen to me they always let me go to like 50 life and like oh i can remove this thing uh, that's pretty funny remember the half of the decks that we've mentioned and we're like man this deck's really relying on the board you really needed to stick a lot of things control is going to just clear the board you're never going to stick on it you're going to they're going to have such a bad matchup against control decks yeah control decks are good against on board decks. just like eat them alive definitely very very true uh stereotypical commanders i think of uh, Usually, I want to think of something with blue in it. I uh, blue white commanders like uh, what? What's the guy who attacks and rebounds? Tie him. Tie him. I think of him for a control deck. What do you think of? I had Queen Marchesa as one. There's mm -hmm. there's probably some other ones you can do. Yeah, I mean, uh, almost anything can be a control deck as long as the commander is sort of mid rangey and draws cards. You want yeah, you want card draw. Card draw is so important for your control decks. A while back, we did a tier list of all of these. So see where we ranked all of these on a tier list. Check out that video. Peace out, Tribe Scouts.